I'm going to share with you a general metaphor about life. It's brought me a ton of value, helped me maintain perspective over the years, and I think it's going to help you as well. I'm going to be using YouTube as my example here, but worry not, this applies to everything. I just happen to be immersed in the content creation space. So to frame it, the growth of a YouTube channel is a lot like the stock market. You certainly want it trending up over time. You want your work to reach, you know, as many people as it can. But there are and have been segments along the way where that growth slows down. There are times when the channel overall, it just gets less engagement, less views, all of it. And you look at it when that's happening, when you're in the midst of one of those dips and you think, oh no, what have I done? Anytime something you're creating slows down, it can be jolting. And this has, over the years, occurred many times. And every time, my instinct is the same. It's, ugh. You know, that type of just duress. And I put a lot of time, energy, effort into this. This work is some of what I'm most proud of in my life. So it's like, sound the alarm right now. I need to figure this out. And every time things eventually correct and continue in that upward trend. Sometimes it takes a little longer than others, but I get there. And here's what I've learned. When there is a dip or a slowing down of anything that's going in the opposite direction of the way you want it to go, I do four things. One, pause and breathe. Because you have to regain, recapture that perspective. Life, as I say so often, is, is simply not that serious, so stop making mountains out of molehills. Two, seek to understand why. There is some sort of change. What's different? What prompted the change? Knowing that is power, so find it. Three, once you have that information, make the necessary alteration. It's not only about having the answer, but it's in implementation. It's adjusting, it's testing. And four, be patient, trust the process. You can be ferocious in your day-to-day -day and also calm and poised with the overall process and faith in its unfolding. And so I'm gonna give you one more YouTube example and then we'll pull it up to a level that's more broad and applicable everywhere, right? Something interesting about YouTube is that a lot of channels only have a handful of videos. We'll say four or five that generate the majority of that channel's interactions, right? It's a pretty common thing. And so when things slow down, you can often point to one of those four or five videos. So let's say something does, there's a dip. You one, you take that breather. Two, you inquire, pull back the hood. What's going on, right? It looks like one of these videos is not getting clicked as much as it was or it should. Okay, that's great to know. Now what do we do about it? Test different thumbnails, right? Try new ones. And you try and it fails, and you try and it fails, and you try and it fails, and you try and bam, one resonates. This new thumbnail gets clicked 3.3% of the time instead of 2.8. Everything goes back up. Impressions go back up. We have righted the ship. Right? And I know that's a very detailed example. Not everyone's a YouTuber, but everyone's, you know, in their own way, niche down doing their thing, right? And so you have to look at it in the context of what you're doing. What's your metaphorical YouTube channel? When things are wrong, how can you pull back the hood, identify that piece and tweak? Right? If we step outside that box, what we'll find is that life is like that stock market. It's like a YouTube channel. It's not up and up and up. There are lows. There are metaphorical recessions. There are times where it feels like the world is collapsing around us and we think, oh no, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? It's over. In reality, nothing is over. This is the roller coaster ride that is life. You don't get highs without lows. And when you think about it, you wouldn't appreciate them without the lows either. The setbacks are baked into the growth. 
And I'll use relationships as another example because I know in some way it's relatable to everyone. When the wheels fall off the wagon with the relationship that meant something to you, whether it's a breakup, or falling out with a friend, whatever the case may be, the tendency is to perceive it as a falling down, the walls crashing down, rather than a, a little blip on your S&P 500. So what do you do? Same exact plan. One, breathe. Understand that this is a process and all will be well. Two, you understand the why. You're human. You're going to feel emotion before you can reach any level of necessary pragmatism to fix anything. So allow that to occur. Gather yourself and then ask what prompted the break. Were you too different? Did you not align? Why? What did you learn about yourself? about the type of people you allow into your life. Three, once you have that information, adjust. How can you be better moving forward? You'll never be perfect. Human beings are complicated and messy and relationships are not an exact art. Too many variables. But that doesn't mean you can't improve your approach in the future, right? mitigate some of the mistakes you made, target the things and people that you truly value. And as you do, and you are, number four, patient in the process, you'll find things level out and ultimately begin to rise. That situation was not and never was the end of you. It was a, a necessary low before a future high. And so 10,000 foot view. Remember that during your difficult time, those moments aren't indicators that life isn't working for you. They are a part of every journey, factors necessary to every ascent. And if you see them as such, you will conquer them, learn from them, and climb them to that place you most need to be. What if those less than ideal things in our lives, right? So our, our limitations, our constraints, the aspects of life we consider to be, you know, a bad hand. What if they weren't just things we need to learn to accept or little tragedies we have to live with? What if they were ultimately the aspects of our lives that create the best of us? the elements of our world that push us to our greatness. And this came to mind earlier. I was listening to a book uh, called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Robertson. And he explores this point. He talks about Socrates in ancient Athens and how he lived in abject poverty. How, according to the standards of ancient Athens, was not an attractive person by any means just seemed to have a lot working against him. And the question that's posed is whether these exact circumstances ultimately created the man that became one of the most important thinkers in history. He implies that his reality and his surroundings shaped his worldview, so it only makes sense for one to conclude that all of it contributed to the life he lived. If Socrates was born wealthy and attractive and all these things, could he have become the man that he became? Probably not. And the reason I love this is because, to put it simply, it reframes those less than ideal circumstances in our lives. Whether it is a personal trait we have no control over or an occurrence we deal with. It's understanding that a, a lack of ability in one area helps guide us to that spot where we can thrive. A disappointment we encounter helps us regroup and make our way to the thing that is ultimately best. The less than ideal, the things that at surface level seem bad or problematic, 
They're always working for us to push us towards our contentment and our growth to our greatness. I can say on my end, it was the turbulence I experienced in my life that created that sense of curiosity for me. It was a lack of understanding that pushed me to write about life, explore the hardships we face, and the resilience of the human spirit through it all. There's a pretty uh, famous stoic idea that states, we can't often control what happens, but we can always control how we respond to what happens. And there lies the power in the understanding that when one door closes, as the saying goes, you are pushed closer to the one that will open for you. You have to decide whether you will uh, find it within yourself to open it. Or will you focus on the lack, the gap, what's not there, what you don't have, what went wrong? See, all those things, the things that most people use as their reason to stop or quit or not go, they can be the reason you lose or they can be the very reason you win. You find a way. But that means moving forward, trusting there is good to be had, understanding that everything that goes creates space for what truly needs to be there. I understand it's common, right? But it's not just a cliche that adversity creates us, that difficult times shape us. Why? Because we are transformed by the bad and the difficult and that which in the moment does not seem ideal. Because they force us to move further into what we were meant to do and who we were meant to be. Just like Socrates was created from his adverse situation, his brilliance derived from his circumstance, your greatness will be derived from yours. So remember that next time you feel as though you've been slighted by life or something's been taken away from you. While it may feel negative, and I get it, from time to time it does, it ultimately becomes the wind at your back, bringing you where you most need. Feeling stuck is a feature, not a bug. Having moments of doubt is a feature, not a bug. Losing perspective from time to time is a feature, not a bug. There's no way to, to step out into the world and avoid these things. Therefore, the question is not, will these moments arise? The question is, when they inevitably do, what will you make of them? And I think that fork in the road is often very misunderstood. How you look at the world around you is everything. Not because, uh, as the great Tony Robbins says, you close your eyes and chant, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, and they're suddenly gone from your garden, but because it's indicative of the choice we have. That when something happens, we don't always get to control um, how it unfolds before us, but we do get to choose what it means. And that's it. A simple decision. And you can see how it's just as easy to go one way as it is to go another. Right? Citing another brilliant voice in this space, Jim Rohn used to say something along the lines of, success is easy. Right? It's nothing more than a few simple decisions every day. Well, when asked, why isn't everyone successful? He'd say, because being unsuccessful is easy too. Choosing not to do those things is easy too. Right? Everything is about your decoder. The world provides the pieces, but it makes you the architect. And so, what are you building? 
The ones who have had the greatest impact, designed beautiful change, added value to the world, they did it through chaos. Yet those who are the angriest, who've done very little with the gifts allotted to them, they'll cite some variation of chaos for the reason they haven't succeeded. It's the lens, it's the decoder, it's the fork in the road and you choosing which direction you will take. If you're feeling trapped in a routine, you have, in some capacity, taken the pieces around you and created a story of limitation. You're forgetting that nothing is stopping you from trying something new today, taking a risk today. When you're feeling insufficient or like everyone around you has it all figured out, you've taken the pieces and created a story of imaginary adversaries. This is not you versus the world. It is you versus you. This moment has given you a fresh start, a chance to find alignment with that which is meaningful to you. One of my favorite metaphors, life is a staircase, where the chaos and the turbulence are ultimately there for you to tame and then move on to the next step. In fact, that's the only way we climb. The world will consist of challenges, and one of the most important gifts we can give to ourselves is to remove the notion that we can just waltz on through with zero problems. Having that as the benchmark sets us up for failure. There is no perfect path or pursuit. Instead, ask, where is the value? When we fall, ask, where is the value? How can I rise, grow, adjust? That's why perspective is everything. One man or woman's business failure is the reason he says, ah, I tried and talks about what could have been over beer with his buddies for the next decade. Another man or woman's failure is the reason she's able to pinpoint where the problems existed and come back stronger, wiser, armed with solutions. See, these aren't wildly different uh, circumstances or initial occurrences. What has occurred are wildly different interpretations wildly different reactions. Trust me, I'm human. I get the instinct to point out at the world, to shake your fist at the sky, turn your back on the opportunity. But in truth, that's the only way to ensure value is not obtained. There's a stoic anecdote about a teacher on a boat out at sea during a storm and it's enormous, right? The waves are crashing over the side of the boat, rocking the boat back and forth. And that teacher turns pale, just like everyone else. He freezes in fear, just like everyone else. The only difference is the teacher is not crying out or screaming, right? And the message here is that the initial reaction, that's human. It's human to feel anger, human to feel frustration, fear, doubt. The difference comes down to, can you pause? Can you collect yourself and instead of immersing yourself in the emotion, ask, what can I become from this? That is power. A relationship ended, okay. How can I now plant a seed to greater fulfillment? The plan didn't work. Okay. Why? What can I learn that will be advantageous on the next approach? I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Okay. Instead of thinking less of yourself for the lack of knowledge, how about appreciating the fact that you've established a foundation upon which a solution can now be sought? Losses do not exist so long as adversity is pointed out and transformed into value. And whether or not that happens is entirely up to you. When it hurts, there is value. When you're down, there is value. There's always something so long as we learn to find it. And that's what will make all the difference. 
Adversity is not avoidable, but living right means knowing it can't be avoided because it's a requirement. It's from the chaos that calm and order and meaning and growth and momentum are obtained. So even though you may be tempted to turn your back, to run or cry out when the winds are strong and the waves come crashing down on your reality, remember that you can not only withstand the disarray, but you can come out on the other side stronger. Every step you take is an investment. Every decision to do the difficult thing is a gift to your future self. Think about this for a second. One of the many things that makes being human so incredible is our ability to engage in delayed gratification, to do things now that will elevate us at a future time. And at a a fundamental level, we understand that. We've heard the famous marshmallow study where kids were left alone in a room with the marshmallow placed in front of them and the ones who showed restraint and could resist eating it ended up uh, in many regards being more successful as adults. We've all heard the mantras, working hard pays off. That's valuable. But I'd like to take it a step further. Because when you say yes in the face of adversity, when you move forward when tired, seek out a way amidst the chaos of life, you are contributing to a foundation so powerful that it will elevate you in ways outside your current level of awareness. By simply saying yes, when I was unsure and often fearful, by continuing to write and speak, I was unknowingly building these opportunities that would manifest years later, right? Many of which were not planned. They were not methodical. My dedication and my North Star never changed. I held on tightly to those, but uh, the surrounding components were always moving and transforming. People are in my life today because of steps I took five years ago. I know things about myself and my hopes and my dreams because of risks I took when I was, let's face it, too ignorant to understand their repercussions. But I knew it felt right. See, here's what I did understand. If I, as Emerson put it, hitched my wagon to a star and moved towards it, when I felt great and when I didn't, when I was confident and when I wasn't, when I was winning and when I was not, I knew the other stuff would take care of itself. I trusted the process. And here's why that matters. Here's why I'm taking you all on a little trip down memory lane. Because writing, speaking, inspiring, storytelling, they are my world within. What is yours? What is it that moves you, that lights up your soul? I want you to know that. I want you to know that because its pursuit requires not only a delayed gratification, but an acceptance that your dedication will evolve in ways so incredible that you can't even imagine. That all those little decisions become emergent and together represent something more powerful than the sum of its parts. I love the example or idea of the human brain, right? So complex and powerful that it appears almost divine. It's essentially a universe behind our eyes. Even our understanding, our comprehension is minimal. We are awed by its capability. Yet it's not about one single piece of the brain, the tissues or the neurons individually. It's the network all these microscopic occurrences create together. Something bigger than everything combined, creating a consciousness we can't even find or point to when looking at the evidence. But we know it exists, and we know it's somehow derived from this ball of nervous tissue. This is not unlike one's pursuit of excellence. 
the level of achievement or consciousness we are searching for. It can't be singularly identified. It's emergent. It materializes after the discipline, after the consistent work, after the self-belief, after the will to do what is required, whether we wanted to in the moment or we didn't. Then we get our quote unquote consciousness. You can't and won't always see the value in your dedication, in your sacrifice. And let me level with you. I get how crazy it feels to think yeah, but someday it will mean something. Someday that work will put people in my life that will change my world, elevate my existence. It will create opportunities that expedite my evolution, lessons and occurrences that will amplify my wisdom and worldview. But that's the name of the game. If you know in your heart you are pointing to the right star, then it's just about stepping, adjusting and repeating. Move, adjust, move, adjust, move, adjust. There will be a time when you look over your shoulder and are stunned by what you've created, by the distance you've traveled. Look, you can't see the future. You can't know what everything will mean and what will occur but you can continue forward into the darkness so that when the long-awaited light inevitably presents itself, you are in position to receive it, to stand on the foundation you have been building all along. Twenty-two lessons from 2022. Number one, life has hidden costs. And this is an idea that Jim Rohn spoke about a lot, really resonates with me. And it's uh, something that I tried to keep front and center in 2022. Here's a quote from him. He says, it isn't what the book costs, it's what it will cost if you don't read it. In other words, sometimes in an effort to avoid a price up front, we end up paying a greater price on the back end. Along the lines of, if you think going is expensive, wait until you see the price tag associated with not going. Missing that opportunity is what's expensive. But he also comes at it from another angle. He tells a story about his friend who bought a TV and Jim asks him, hey, how much did that TV cost? His friend says, $400. Jim says, ah, I don't think so. Try again. And his friend says, Jim, I bought it. It was $400. And Jim says, no, I think it's costing you millions. Referring to the amount of time that he wastes sitting in front of that TV when he could be improving his life, his business, his relationships, his health. Right, the moral of the story is sometimes what we don't do costs us more than we can imagine and we have to be aware of those hidden costs. Lesson number two, find the good. So this Christmas, I just got back from uh, spending it with my family up in Boston. And while I was there, our cat that we've had for 20 years, since I was a kid basically, you know, passed away. And, you know, when we went to, uh, to put her down, I was definitely sad about it, but it was even harder for me to see my mom and my sister, you know, really uh, devastated by it all. You know, having to say goodbye to Fuzzle, right? It's hard to see people you love in a dark place. And so as we walked out of the vet clinic the day after Christmas, I thought to myself, what's interesting is this whole thing was unavoidable, obviously. 20 years alone is a very long time for an animal or a cat to live. Our time here is temporary. We're passing by. And death aside, there are devastating things in life that are unavoidable, but you can't miss them, right? Pain is very good at making itself recognizable. 
We always seem to see it and feel it. But contrast that with the happy things, the meaningful things, the things that we appreciate. For some reason, they tend to be better at going undercover. Right? Like, we don't realize some of our most important moments were our most important moments until they're gone. And I look at this and it's like, okay, Fuzzle wasn't just our cat for 20 years. She was our childhood. And in a unique way, she represented the Christmases and the birthday parties, the sports games, the friends, uh, graduating high school, going to college, moving to new places. A lot of things along the way. And I use this quote all the time uh, because I just think it so perfectly captures the essence of, of what I'm trying to say here. Ed Helms' character in The Office, Andy Bernard, says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. In other words, we can't be reminded enough to look for the meaningful things the happy and beautiful things. I believe they're more numerous than the painful stuff. They're just so well camouflaged that we walk by them. We don't realize until 20 years later, we look over our shoulder and go, yeah, that was special. 2022 taught me to be better at recognizing and appreciating those good things. Lesson number three, sometimes progress is unremarkable. I was going through some older videos on my YouTube channel, and I found a few that I couldn't help but cringe watching back. And just to be clear, I'm proud of everything I've done. Everything played a role in getting me to where I am now. It's all a journey, and I did a lot of experimenting and pivoting and trying things, and and I'm proud of that, right? But I took a little trip down memory lane to roughly 2017 to 2020. I was really experimenting, trying to craft my style. And I remembered how during that time, the viewership had dropped pretty substantially. Finances were inconsistent. I was looking ahead and starting to worry, right? And and, and a lot of the time, I just felt embarrassed to still be going. Like my ego hurt when I woke up in the morning. That's just me being truthful. I was working so many hours, more hours than I'd ever worked, and was just Seeing things slip. And looking back now, I realize how easy it would have been to quit during that stretch specifically. To have walked away and done literally anything else. But I didn't. I made adjustments. I got better. Ultimately pushed through it. But the most important thing I've done in my life was keep going during that stretch. A powerful reminder just how unremarkable the most important progress we're making can seem. James Clear's ice metaphor. Water placed in a freezer doesn't immediately turn to ice. No, things are happening. Transformation is occurring long before we see that physical confirmation. It takes a while to hit that 32 degree mark. And I hope everyone is aware of that. Every step counts. And I learned this again and again. Lesson number four, find and push out the negativity. In the book, It Takes What It Takes, author Trevor Moad performed uh, an experiment where he made a point for 30 days. And actually, I think you only got to maybe day 27 or 28. Uh, But regardless, he made a point to listen to and consume negative media. His list included country music, which was eye-opening for me. I listened to it all the time. But he references that joke, you play a country song in reverse, you get your wife, your trailer, your dog, and your job back, right? A lot of it's inherently uh, sad stuff. Um, He listened to national news nonstop, sad movies, And the list just goes on and on. And he said the change was so drastic that it was hard for him to function. He stopped feeling good about himself in social settings. He stopped early because it was so uh, debilitating. 
And this got me thinking about what I consume. Let me tell you, there's a lot of negativity that creeps in there from a wide variety of places. And this is number four, because I think we can all be better at recognizing and mitigating those things. Number five, it's not about you. Or at least it's rarely about you. This is a quick reminder I picked up while working through the end of a lease for my apartment. A couple months ago, I decided I was going to renew for another year. But it just so happened that uh, the process was a nightmare, right? Everything seemed to go wrong. Eventually, I got to the point where I started to get angry and uh, took the situation personally. Enough was enough, right? So I went down, kind of barged into the office to ask what in God's name was going on only to find the people that work there running around, uh, trying to put out fires, help a bunch of folks with all these questions, and they were being patient and kind under the circumstances. And in that moment, I was reminded that I made something about me that has nothing to do with me. Like, was it annoying? Sure. But chill on the emotion, right? It's like detach yourself from the problem, and instead of throwing a temper tantrum like a seven-year-old, reallocate the energy to finding solutions. That was a great reminder at an important time. You know, it goes for so many things. Stop taking things personal that are, in actuality, not personal at all. Lesson number six, it's okay to say no. All right, and this applies to a variety of areas. When things aren't right, a lot of the time you know immediately whether in my case it's a project I said yes to but felt burdened by and not excited about. Maybe a relationship that felt like a chore but instead of walking away, you tried to negotiate with the pragmatic side of your brain. Or something you're spending a lot of time doing that you know isn't pushing you closer to where you want to be. You know, a lot of life is being able to break the complex down into the simple. And while immersed in these situations or, or situations like them, you know, I frequently saw them as more complicated than they were, right? Rationalizing, well, maybe it's right. Maybe I'll see down the road, you know, whatever the, the, the situation is. But there's a pretty simple rule here. If you get that feeling in your stomach that what you're doing is not aligned with who you are or, or something isn't right, probably isn't. And at the very least, it requires some thought. I think we need to be better about trusting that intuition. The things you spend your time doing, the people you spend your time with, they shouldn't feel like a burden or a chore. They shouldn't break you down. No, they should more often than not light you up. Lesson number seven is hope versus pragmatism. This year, both personally and professionally, I grew in a few areas. One of them was keynote speaking. I took part in some of the biggest speaking engagements uh, of my career so far, and it was really cool to have taken part in them. But here's what I find interesting. Things seem to have happened so incrementally that I didn't even realize each event was an accomplishment or the completion of a personal goal until after the fact, like on the car or on the way to the airport or on the plane thinking, nice, that was awesome, right? Each event just seemed like the next logical thing. And that's one of my biggest lessons. When you're ready for something, it doesn't feel like the universe is doing you a favor. There is no hoping. There are no crossed fingers. It's just you doing you. It's the compounding of effort. And when I go back to some of my previous uh, New Year's Eve uh, thinking, it was man, I hope this is the year I get that big break. I hope this is the year I reach more people. Everything happens. It all changes. But at the time, I wasn't ready for any of those things I was hoping for. What we get is proportional to the value we add, and I had a lot to learn. The overall point being, don't ask the world to give you anything. Ask yourself to live your life in such a way that you are ready for it. Build yourself up in such a way that you don't even notice the transformation. Lesson number eight, turn your goals into a lifestyle. 
There are things that I wanted to change in 2022. I wanted to stay healthy, and that meant less injuries. It meant cross-training, diversifying my workout. It meant eating healthier. And where I saw the most progress was when I stopped looking at each of those changes as uh, one-off alterations and saw everything in totality as a lifestyle change I was making. One of my favorite quotes is, people follow through on who they believe themselves to be. Well, when I started thinking of myself as a healthy, athletic person, living a healthy, athletic lifestyle, not only did things feel right, but I found everything easier to maintain. When something's your identity, almost subconsciously, you push out the things that don't fit that personal identity. You invite in the things that do. And of course, our lives are the manifestation of the little things we do, right? The compounding of habits. But to me, this highlights uh, the value of creating an umbrella for those little things to fit under. Human beings are storytellers, so tell yourself the right story. Reverse engineer the big picture goal. When you adjust and create a lifestyle, change is inevitable. Lesson number nine, make it count. So this is uh, about the Charlotte Airport. Uh, Someone once asked me if I'd been to Charlotte. And I thought, not really, right? The airport doesn't count. I didn't see any of the culture or the food or the sports teams or any of that stuff. Uh, Which got me thinking, what does make you present? What makes anything count? Did you really have dinner with someone if you were both on your phones the whole time? I'm not so sure. Did today count? If every second you were consumed with worries about what's coming in the future, constantly replaying the past? Maybe. Who's to say? Obvious gray area here. But I'd like to more frequently and definitively move the needle in 2023 to the it counts category of life. Now, I still have to figure out exactly what that means and how it will play out. But I know I can't let my time on this planet be a metaphorical passing through the Charlotte airport. In a world where distraction seems to be everywhere, I want to position myself to live fully. Lesson number 10. First, find faith in yourself. One of my favorite stories this year was when I was having dinner with a friend of mine and he was reflecting back on an investment he made to be mentored by someone he thought very highly of. It was like a two-day job shadow. And he's going through the experience, telling me how he flew over there, met up with the guy. And the entire thing was underwhelming. He was unorganized, seemed to be winging it, wasn't a very nice guy. And my natural reaction was to say, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I'll never forget him pausing and saying the line, oh no, Eddie, that was the best investment I ever made. I learned that if this guy can do it, then so can I, right? What's my excuse? So much of our success is predicated upon us giving ourselves permission to achieve it. Step one is always believe yourself worthy of the journey. Lesson number 11. What you do speak so loud that I cannot hear what you say. That's a quote from Emerson. And this one's short and sweet. Remember that what people in your life tell you is one thing, but it's what they do that means the most. The way I see it, words are meant to supplement action and nothing more. Lesson number 12. The old way isn't always the right way. Something that stuck with me as a creator and a business owner was someone telling me that I had to make some substantial changes to the way I approached my business. And after explaining that, hey, this approach has been incredibly valuable to me in the past, They responded, well, if if where you are is where you aim to stay, then yeah, of course, don't change. And that simple statement helped me gain some perspective. 
right? As the saying goes, what got you to where you are is not the same thing that's required to get you to where you need to be next. You don't climb a 1,000 foot mountain the same way you climb a 20,000 foot mountain. You don't make six figures the same way you make seven figures. Adjustments have to be made. And that's not a referendum on your previous approach, that's just evolution. You have to evolve along with your ambition. Lesson number 13, embrace the turbulence. I was on a flight and we hit some turbulence at some point. And no matter how many times I go through this, I can't help but feel that unease in my stomach. Right? When I got home, I actually Googled the question, you know, how many flights have crashed due to turbulence? Surprising uh, to, to find that answer to be zero. No plane has ever crashed because of turbulence. Still, even after that, right, when I uh, sit through turbulence on planes, that same feeling surfaces, fear. No matter what we're doing in life, we'll never completely detach from fear. The, the unknown is an innately scary thing. Now, this is not that feeling of moral or personal conflict I mentioned earlier, when you know in your heart you're stepping into shoes that aren't your own I'm talking about knowing something is right, but fearing the road before you, a very human thing. Change comes with turbulence. It's inescapable, it's unavoidable. But down the road, we often find it was a small price to pay for the new reality we've just made for ourselves. Lesson number 14. Expect a lot of yourself, but give yourself grace. Life is often a dance between extremes. Aim high, but step small. Hold a vision, but make, uh, you know, tangible, pragmatic moves. If there's something I'm guilty of doing. It's setting the target incredibly high. And then when the swings and misses inevitably happen, you know, being very upset with myself, you know, sometimes you don't get through everything you plan to do. Sometimes the outcome falls short and that's okay. You know, make the adjustments. Be proud of yourself for expecting great things of yourself and come back better tomorrow. Being your own toughest critic only makes sense if you are your own greatest ally. Which leads perfectly into lesson 15. Yesterday is merely a data point. There's a quote that states the windshield is bigger than the rear view for a reason. Well, one thing that life has emphasized this year is that when you attempt to innovate and try new things, you'll make mistakes. You just will, that's how it goes. It can be frustrating, you know, replaying the story in your head again and again, the if onlys and I wish I had. But there's no sense in doing that because life gave you something valuable. It gave you a data point. So take that and use it to guide and shape future decisions. The rear view gives you a condensed depiction of what's behind you because its role, while valuable, is, is nowhere near as powerful as what's before you in the present. Lesson number 16, distraction versus achievement. This is another quote I came across in 2022 that is extraordinary. It's Robin Sharma. He says, you can either be distracted or you can do incredible things, but you cannot do both. That is everything. And it's something I come face to face with every day. You know, to the point where, as I've said before, I have to put my phone in a different room. Sometimes even cut the internet when I write. Because if there's room for distraction, it always seems to find a way. You know, when there's so much distraction in our world. A uh, very obvious example, right? I post uh, my work on like nine or 10 different social media platforms. It would be crazy for me not to care at all about them once I send it out there, right? Of course I'm intrigued and curious. I wanna see how it affected people, what they're saying. 
But being better at emotionally detaching once I hit that upload button has been incredibly valuable for me. As well as, like I alluded to before, creating boundaries between myself and the technology that houses that back and forth. You know, and it begs the question, what are your distractions? What can you do to mitigate them? Deep Work by Cal Newport is an amazing read uh, for those looking for strategies on this topic to build upon. I cannot recommend it enough. Number 17, you're never alone. I've noticed that when we feel most vulnerable, we feel the most alone. Those two things, in my experience, always seem to go hand in hand. But I think it's a feeling that's detached from reality. We are all working, fighting, climbing. So many folks out there are battling their own private hell. In fact, I hear every day from so many incredible people overcoming such a variety of obstacles that it's changed the way I look at the human experience. I see how powerful human beings can be on a daily basis. How we all have our own battles, but we are also all equipped to persevere. And sometimes I imagine in our darkest moments how incredible it would be to jump into this instant conversation or or Zoom call with millions of others going through something similar, everyone feeling like they are the only ones until they see that reassurance, until they hear the voices of others battling as well. Because half the fight is knowing that you are not alone and I can assure you, you never are. Lesson 18, it isn't until it is. Remember that everything is crazy until it's not. Everything is imaginary until it's in front of your face. It's the ability to, as many people describe it, play the fool that changes things. To do big things, you have to start at square one. You have to be vulnerable enough to step out, to see the unseen, walk the path untraveled. And it's a gauntlet that, while not fun to run, is the only way to get to innovation and change. You have to step into a world that is not yours in order to make it so. Everything isn't until it is. Lesson number 19, invest in yourself. Often effort brings tangible results, right? But sometimes the most important investments don't pay dividends immediately. It's a long-term play on our personal capability, right? Like reading every day, for example, doesn't bring a tangible result. You don't close the book and see more clients or a bigger bank account. But when there are one or two ideas or strategies from that book that you can now implement into everything you do moving forward, those hours spent reading become truly invaluable. And that's just it. We want results and we want wins, but we have to remember that investing in ourselves positions us for an unlimited tomorrow. Lesson number 20, life is an adjustment game. As I've been trying to expand what I'm doing, I consistently find uh, standard operating procedure being something I stumble into. You know, basically things rarely work flawlessly the first time. Throwing things against the wall, picking up the pieces, adjusting and repeating, right? That's how you learn, oh wow, okay, this works. Let's do more of that. And, And that's an entirely different philosophy than expecting excellence out of the gate. You know, in many ways, I don't even aim for the bullseye. I aim to be near it with the trust and understanding that I'll get there in due time. Life is not a perfection game. It will never be a perfection game. It's an adjustment game. Lesson number 21, you are always one decision away. Once you understand this, you understand that you're never down and out. It's never the end. You've never lost. 
No, it's about using what's around you to make the decision that will change your life. There's a change you can make right now in this moment that will redirect your life trajectory. There's something you can do in this moment that will make you better, happier, more fulfilled. Step one is understanding that. Step two is seeking that decision out. No matter how lost or stuck you feel, I wholeheartedly believe this to be true. And lastly, lesson 22, you can often get two for the price of one. This is the ever relevant idea that although we feel like working harder is the answer, it's often working smarter. It's utilizing what's around us. And I'm speaking after a year of primarily being in the digital space, but this applies to so much more. There are so many ways to utilize and streamline what we do, to repurpose our effort, to take our work and utilize it in a slightly different way, take a concept and share it to a different audience, maybe in a different place on a different platform. I've noticed that so many of my greatest wins come from very small alterations to something that already uh, exists or repurposing an idea. Maybe the story's slightly off. Maybe the delivery needs a little bit of a change, or maybe it just wasn't the right time the first time. You know, I catch myself looking outward for never before seen solutions when what I need is already in the palm of my hand. Start from the premise that you have everything you need and work backwards. You will be amazed at what you find. I hope these lessons will bring you as much value as they brought me and that next year uh, we will all be better off because of it. Wishing you a safe, happy, healthy, prosperous 2023. Imagine with me a world where you stopped segmenting out the difficulty in your life as other than, where you stopped seeing the turbulence as an obstacle to your journey. Imagine with me life as a symphony, where everything works together to create the whole, where the high notes, the low notes, the pauses, the rest, the tempo changes, all contribute to the overall theme. None of it's unimportant or dismissible. How could it be? Without the low notes, the high notes don't mean anything. Without the rest, you don't get the satisfaction and the power of the moment that music re-emerges. In fact, it was the contrast that created the magic to begin with. All of it is needed even when you don't understand why. You don't know that this slow beginning, the breaks, the tempo changes, that it will all be the reason you are soon awed by the crescendo that awaits. And how could you? It's one flow. The journey points in one direction. You are in this for the ride. See, in our lives, the obstacles, the chaos, the confusion, they hurt. They're unsettling, so the inclination is to dismiss them, to push them away. This isn't what I need. This is void of value. So get rid of it, we tell ourselves. When in reality, those things are integral components to your song. They are what culminate into your final piece. They're bringing you to that crescendo. Doesn't mean you have to love the challenging times. Of course not. But it does mean we should understand that even though we can't see it unfolding before our very eyes, it's all playing a role. My hurt made me stronger. My struggle injected meaning into my life. It made the song richer, the sound sweeter. Today is what it is because yesterday was what it was. And I know 
when I'm face to face with something that my gut instinct deems to be detrimental, that two things can in fact be true at once. That I need to work to right the ship, to repoint the compass, but also understand that the storm wasn't void of significance. The valley wasn't all for naught. It's gifted me new oceans to cross, new mountains to climb, and new perspective as I peer out over the view. So as you move through the dark, as you navigate the chaos of night, know that the light you're chasing is only meaningful because of the depths you are emerging from. Life beyond these shadows is not where the world begins. It's a continuation of an already beautiful journey you're on. It's your symphony in totality. See, the time will come when you'll look back and you'll be grateful for the so-called inconveniences that surround you now. Your heart needs the contrast that this adversity creates. Your soul depends on the hardship to understand the magnificence of life. It's why now, when it hurts, you must keep going. You have to keep going. You have to let the notes materialize into the beautiful song it will become. The masterpiece it was meant to become. We have so much to let go of, to dismiss. Ideas, narratives, they're not ours, not in our best interest anyway, yet we carry them around. Carry them around like we're perpetually tied to the lies they espouse, the fiction they propagate. We have to let go before we add a single thing, before we adopt another way, it all has to go. I don't remember where I've seen it, but I know I have. Maybe cartoons when I was younger, but I'm imagining that character that is taking off their jacket or shirt, and there's always another one underneath it, right? And they're like confused, frantically pulling off shirts and more and more keep emerging. They had no idea how many layers they were carrying around with them. And funny enough, 20 years later, I'd be thinking that we are no different. There are so many layers and so many of them should be gone, should be left, should be confined to the dustbin of history. Those boundaries in your life, who set them? Who said this is as far as you can go? Who put that little fence around your world and ask that you stay obediently confined to its borders. Who said that what you have is all there is? Who said upside is too dangerous? Who said life is about predictability and routine, so stop asking questions? No one. No one said those things. So hey, there's a start. Empty your pockets of the boundaries that are making life heavy. What about yesterday? Might as well take off that backpack, tip it upside down, and pour out the yesterday. You made mistakes yesterday. Ah, but that's not today. You didn't like certain aspects of who you were yesterday. But that's not today either. Your friends, maybe family, maybe others in your life knew you to be someone. Someone you don't think you are or someone you wish you weren't. Well, more breaking news, that was yesterday. Did you even realize you're still carrying around who you were yesterday on your back? Your next step has a lot to do with now and very little to do with yesterday. So embrace and wave goodbye 
to those calendar pages you've already turned. That's the best move for everyone. Oh, and those concessions you make? You didn't think I'd forget those. You can't forget those. Unshackle them from your ankle. Those things you say, eh, you're not ideal, but it's easier to live a lesser life with you in it than it is to go through the trouble of pushing you away. Perhaps the people that darken your light, the actions that you know are not you, the time exhausted living for someone else, gone, gone, and gone, it has to go. And look, we all know life is tricky. It's hard to walk away from things so ingrained into our daily lives for so long. But let's play a game. Let's pretend it was. Pretend life was that simple. Things I need to leave behind. A, B, and C. Well, that's definitely simple. Perhaps not easy, but simple. And now, through this simplified lens, you have a target to aim for. Something to chip away at. You have your block of marble. Now comes the process of chiseling a little bit at a time. And that's the goal. Because to not carry these things ends up meaning everything. Space no longer occupied by the wrong things creates space for the right things. Knocking down what doesn't belong creates a platform to build what does. So onward, we must go, not falling into the trap of pointing at externalities, blaming the world for our confinement, but instead understanding that we have been, perhaps without even realizing it, taking our confinement with us, in our pockets, on our back, trailing behind our every step, a subtle resistance. And when it goes, we can finally grow. We can become more. So what can you do now to live a life that's more meaningful, that's more true to yourself? Well, you can start by doing less of what weighs you down. I'm going to make everything around me beautiful. That will be my life. Elsie DeWolf. Changing for the better is not about the creation of miracles. It's about choosing to see the ones that already exist. Life is hard. But coincidentally, hard things tend to be the gatekeepers to the important ones. We are let in when we bring ourselves finally to shake hands with and embrace the very things we once saw as the problem. Or as Ryan Holiday has famously put it, the obstacle tends to be the way. How funny how counterintuitive, how upside down life can seem. But I think that's it. Sometimes it's not even that we're looking at the wrong things. So we're looking at the right things the wrong way. Avoiding the call to step further into the world and deeper into ourselves terrified of scraping our knees on the climb, we burden ourselves with the much more painful choice of staying at the bottom of the mountain and looking up. But the scars we've collected and will continue to collect on the way up, they do not make you less than. No, they are what make you beautiful. You see yourself and those scars as imperfect. I see someone who has lived, who has taken risks, fallen, and bounced back. 
I see character and wisdom and elegance and boldness. In an imperfect world, those quote-unquote flaws and scars may, funny enough, just be the closest thing to perfection we'll ever experience. It's from our courage to step out, our willingness to crack that we flourish. Living necessarily includes a deterioration over time, but a deterioration of the external, because the internal the soul, it stays young. It's underneath that forever crumbling world around us that we find the divine. It is because of our scars, not despite them, that we grow our wings. They aren't to be feared but coveted. You are more because of the mistakes you made, the challenges you faced the adjustments you had to see through. And I believe our value increases with each tear and break, resembling the Japanese art of Kintsugi, where a pot that breaks and is put back together with golden lacquer holds more value than the original unblemished piece. See, Wolf says, I'm going to make everything around me beautiful. And I think this simply calls for an optical adjustment, a shift in relations between things and how you perceive those things. Me, I don't want the whitest, cleanest, newest shoes as far as I'm concerned, there's very little beauty to preserve there. I want shoes with worn soles from the miles and miles they carried me. Holes from the distance I had to walk to find the people who add joy to my life. Cracks from running in the rain while the rest of the world stayed inside. I want my imperfections to show that I lived while I was here. So from now on, let's stop conflating perfect and beautiful. Perfect is no skin in the game. Perfect is standing forever in the doorway looking out. Perfect is dreaming and wishing and hoping, but never leaving. Because leaving is where our vision brushes up against a reality we may see as too big. No, we want not perfect, but beautiful. We want scars and flaws and lessons and loss. Because from those things as difficult as they may be, we're born again. Imperfection is life, and life is beautiful. So here's to more scuffed shoes and scraped knees, to walking an imperfect yet beautiful road ahead. There's an old idea that once you've started, you're halfway there. How does that make sense, one might wonder? Once you've started, you've only just begun. And that's true, technically. But here's the thing. The journey, the ins and outs, ups and downs, trials and tribulations, they can all be dealt with. They knock us down from time to time, no doubt. But we learn 
we adjust and carry on as we move forward. Most success stories, they're crushed, not because of that adversity along the way, but because they never begin. They never take shape or materialize. We can't make them real in our heads. We can't convince ourselves that they'll ever be anything other than fiction. We think that's for someone else. We look around and assume that reality is different than my reality. And overcoming this mental constraint is always the most challenging step. And that saying, the one I continuously find myself coming back to, human beings always follow through on who they believe themselves to be, continues to be true. If you don't believe you're worthy of something, its pursuit is lost before it began. So while the mind tries to paint pictures of how scary that road is ahead, how it's too different or big or complex, understand that should you move forward, you'll find all that complexity can be broken down one day, one situation, one little step at a time. The only real demon here is the possibility of inaction because you couldn't make yourself believe it. You couldn't see yourself at the top of that mountain. And so, the front door was never opened. Emerson says, hitch your wagon to a star. A beautiful reminder that that star is proof your dreams are real. And only as real as the conviction with which you move towards them. Green light your own glory, your own contentment. Because contrary to what we might think, no one comes up and bestows that upon us. To live life fully is a decision. Decision, Latin root words, cut off. It's removing and abandoning your restraint in order to be more authentically you in order that you'll give yourself permission to chase down that which makes you feel alive and soak up all that aligns with your heart and soul. Once you start, you're halfway there. And oh, that first step, often perceived as the beginning, but in actuality a point few ever give themselves the luxury of experiencing. Step one, believe it's possible. Step two, believe you're worthy. Step three, go. Everything else works itself out. You're capable of dancing through life's chaos, of managing the world's unknowns. So know that, understand that, but most importantly, be one of the few who gives themselves permission to experience that. And it starts now. You can salvage the day. You can salvage the week, the month, the year, the years. All is not lost. It's never lost. The trap is looking back and using what happened to define what will happen. Using what's behind you to map what's in front of you. What brought this to mind? Well, personal note, this has happened before. Today was not a good one, at least not until now. Not from a productivity standpoint. I just got back from Europe, a little jet lagged. I've never had more to do 
but simultaneously done so little with my time. Which is frustrating. But I'm going to the gym in an hour, and that leaves me 60 minutes to salvage what could easily have been looked back upon as a lost day. See, something that I think is beautiful about life is that you can get countless things wrong, you're afforded substantial room for error, and it's often, you know, you only need to get one thing right. Like, take dating, right? Countless wrong relationships, you only need one to work out, right? Entrepreneurship, ton of mistakes, lots of swings and misses, that's built into the process, but the one win can change everything. Or these stories, these ideas I share on social media, right? A lot of them totally miss. They resonate with me and, you know, sometimes me alone. But if one resonates with others, one gains traction, there's a lot of impact to be had there. And so I wanted to share this because it's a slightly different angle to what I've talked about before. Of course, this has elements of, yeah, you don't feel like it, well, do it anyway. Right? David Goggins would have an aneurysm uh, hearing that I even contemplated not writing today. But here's the thing. It's very easy to group a period of time together and call it a loss. Eh, it didn't happen today, it might tomorrow. Right? It's easy to look back on what you were and use it to build walls uh, around yourself. To say it's what you are now. When in reality, there is still value to be squeezed out. Just because what existed before now was antithetical to everything you wanted it to be, well, that doesn't mean there's no win buried in there. It doesn't mean between 4.45 and 5.45 here today, I can't share something that's important to me that might help other people identify and dive into something that's important to them, right? All is not lost if time remains. It's a message that, sure, it might be psychologically easier to walk away from the day because the first half wasn't good, but that's not the move. There contains somewhere in there the seed that will grow, or at least begin the process of growing what you need. Jim Quick, he recently said, some days all you have is 40%. And on those days, giving 40% is 100%. Maybe seeing that subconsciously saved my day today. I don't know, but it's very easy to check out uh, when the past was not what you wanted it to be. Instead of thinking, yeah, but one right move right now changes everything, changes the momentum, alters the personal identity. You're always one move, one decision away from reigniting momentum. A quote unquote bad day can be completely mitigated uh, with one incredible decision or action. So let's pull this up a level. Where does it bring us? It brings us to those moments we're sitting in bed, wishing things were a little different went a little differently. Or looking in the mirror, disappointed in the day. And instead of letting it define the story in totality, remembering that there's something there. Maybe just one thing. One action. One decision. One move you can take to salvage what remains. There's some value you can find that will reposition your outlook on what has occurred. There is no loss here, only the win that hasn't happened yet. Thoreau said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Probably an astute observation, as most death is potential put to rest. Most stories were stories about what could have been. Perhaps simply because it's easier on the ego to talk about what life could have looked like if you cared enough to shape it than to have actually put skin in the game and fallen short. 
But there lies the misconception. To step into life's chaos with the hopes of taming it is why we're here. And yeah, obviously it hurts to fail. It hurts uh, to be vulnerable, to put yourself out there. Especially when it seems as though all eyes are on you. But that hurt is a fraction of the hurt the road describes. Falling hurts, but it hurts less than wishing you had the courage to fall. Ridicule, it hurts. But it hurts less than being the one on the sidelines, pointing the finger and simultaneously longing for the courage to take action in their own life. What keeps us from going? What keeps us from building? We know life is short. We know regret is the ultimate pain. We know how much opportunity is out there. So why? Why would we not go? Why would we designate dreaming to sleep? In his famous Man in the Arena speech, Teddy Roosevelt said this, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. No one who is content in their own life will go out of their way to bring you down. There was never a critic deeply immersed in their own journey who took the time to mock or scoff at the man in the arena. I think our fear is pointed in the wrong direction. It shouldn't be concentrated on or focused on the opinions of those who have not yet themselves walked through those doors. No, the fear should be letting life go by without ourselves walking through. The fear should be contributing to Thoreau's statistic of quiet desperation. The one most men face. But you are not most men or most women. Not because you were given some special power or status. but because you decided. You can choose not to be like most people. Basic math, taking into account the number of people in the stands versus the number of people on the stage or court or in the arena, well, it tells a tale of courage. Anyone can sit in the stands. Anyone can. Anyone can from the nosebleeds decide whether to clap or point or boo or cheer, but who suits up and enters the game? Who looks at the finitude of life and says, this is my reason to start building, to put it all on the line? Because if I fail, it will mean I was one of the few who looked around and said, this isn't bigger than I am. 
This world is not predefined, it's being built in real time by those willing to walk through the doors and step into the arena. Not the critics, but the doers. And look, everyone has a thing, right? I don't know what that thing is for you, but you do. You probably think about it all the time, dream about it every day. You probably know it's where your heart is pulling you. Do not let your life become a statistic. Don't you dare go to that graveyard having been someone who held on tighter to excuses than to what mattered most in your life. So go. Step into the arena, and if they point, let them point. If they criticize, let them criticize. Your concern isn't with those wishing they had the courage to step through those doors themselves. It's not about them, it's about you. It's about understanding the beauty and the opportunity and the freedom contained in life for those who find the courage to reach out and take it. What is the complex but an accumulation of that which is simple? What are big things, if not just a multitude of little things? There's comfort in the understanding that all we have in life, all there is, is simplicity. Easy to understand pieces. It's just that sometimes we stack them so high that they start to take a new shape. But like Greg McCune references in his book Essentialism, the power isn't always in acquiring answers. You already have them. They're in front of you. The power is in cutting away the things that don't need removing all that stands between you and your ideal existence. And I think that's one of life's great misunderstandings. We don't need to find more. We need to remove that excess until we're face to face with what matters. And to adopt this principle, it's, it's nothing short of liberating. Chaos, confusion, disorder, they don't imply that you lack the right things. They suggest you haven't stripped life of the wrong things. You have not simplified. A thousand miles is intimidating when you look at it holistically. It's a long journey. But it's just a collection of steps. And well, shouldn't we find solace in the fact that anyone can take one step? It's not a game of complexity. It's a game of understanding what's in front of you. And what's in front of you is always manageable. So much of our stress stems from forgetting what that journey is made of. Whether it's a change in career, mastery of an art, some kind of personal transformation, the result we want when looking at it from the starting line, it's too complex to understand, too many pieces stacked up. So let's break it down. Let's find the foundation. What's really there? What are the one, two, three things we need to do? What is that golden question? What matters? If you lose sight of that, then you will stumble through life. I've learned this. I've lived it. The time I take to myself every day is invaluable to me because I ask myself those two questions. What matters and what are the simple steps I need to take? Right? What can I remove? I was talking about this during an interview this week, you know, my personal growth. 
And one of the most important aspects has been the understanding and the zeroing in on what's important. I used to take uh, so much pride in composing the background music to these speeches, end to end. And I used to love to be able to say I did it all. That was, so I thought, the great differentiator. But ultimately, I learned to take a step back and ask what matters here. What do you care about? It's the storytelling that I love. It's the impact. And let's be real, no one cares who wrote the background music. It's holistically, how does the piece make you feel? Right, and this understanding allowed me to cut away, license the music, save two days a week, acquire clarity, and realize my goal is not to be Mozart, my journey is to be one of the great communicators, storytellers of our time, and if a day goes by where I'm not taking a little step towards that, it's the wrong move. Small example in the grand scheme of things, but right on point. It's the power in understanding what matters that makes a difference, that allows you to grow, evolve. And I'm confident that this not only applies to long-term pursuits, but also our challenging times, the dark moments, the periods of uncertainty and discontent. Same concept. Where do you want to be and how do you get there? What's the simple thing you can do to close that gap? Because you are never helpless. You can always do something. And my friends, those little somethings ultimately evolve into everything. And when we put our phone away, step beyond the noise, spend time with ourselves, we can see how much of life is running in place. Stacking and stacking pieces that aren't even part of the masterpiece we're trying to assemble. If you want answers, Start with the understanding that they're buried under mountains of things you don't need. So cut away. Cut away the people and places and things that convolute your story. Cut away the exhaustion of time that provides no value in return. Cut away the thoughts that make life more complex than your journey from where you are to where you'd like to be. As you stand right now, you have everything you need and there's nothing greater than that, nothing more powerful than that understanding. So why not step outside the complexity that you've manufactured, that you're living in, into a world of clarity, simplicity, Capture what matters. Dear younger me, there's a lot that you don't know. A lot you're pretty sure you understand, but couldn't possibly wrap your hands around. Because the most important things in life, the things that you'll remember, they're the very things that seem like footnotes in your story. Background noise, hidden in plain view. So younger me, hear me out, because time, time goes by quickly. And we only get one opportunity to do this dance, one chance to do this thing right. Younger me, when you wake up, be thankful for the shoes on your feet, the house you live in, the life you lead. Because if all you do is focus on what you don't have or the next milestone, happiness becomes a mirage. Younger me, the world as you know it isn't something that was destined to be. It's here because people no smarter than you have the courage to build it. Never be scared to challenge what is. This place will be better because of it. 
In younger me, it will always be easier to play it safe, to stay comfortable, but I want you to understand something. That's not where you'll find the good stuff. If you don't take chances, you'll spend your time wondering what could have been. Younger me, believe in your greatness. This world can be a tough place, and if you don't believe in yourself, no one will do it for you. No one will hand you the sky. Earn excellence every day. It's there, I promise. Younger me, don't get distracted by the small stuff, the little things that so easily consume our energy and emotions. Don't lose sight of who you are and what means the most to you. Everything else washes away. Younger me, you didn't have all the answers, but somehow you were exactly what I needed you to be. You created a map. You showed that change can't happen until one falls victim to life's imperfections. That risks aren't taken until you've experienced regret. That confidence isn't acquired if you don't learn to play the student. And most importantly, if you don't allow yourself to get lost, you will never discover who you truly are. 20 years from now, when we meet again, younger me, I know you'll do the same. I know you'll have given me everything I needed, nothing more and nothing less. Because time, time goes by quickly. And we only get one opportunity to do this dance, one chance to make this right. And I promise you, younger me, that it won't be wasted. It makes perfect sense in our busy lives that we sometimes lose sight of fundamental truths. Right? At least from time to time, that's part of being human. And I wanna talk about an important one. The tendency to forget that parts make a whole. Sounds simple, sounds obvious, not so much. That pieces make a stack, that little actions create big change. And I can tell you that every time in my life I've found myself in trouble or overwhelmed or intimidated, it's because that very simple concept has eluded me. You know, and all I can see in the moment is how far I have to go. All I can see is this big intimidating result and I'm not there. And I wanna tell a quick story to provide some context. Those of you who have seen my videos, you probably guessed it, it's running related. Um, but if you're not a runner, hang tight because this is not in any way specific to running. Um, it's just a good way to articulate the message and you'll see that. So the realization occurred uh, a few days ago doing a distance run down A1A, which is just a, a long straight stretch um, down the coast of Florida. It's perfect to kind of zone out and just, just run. Uh, and that's exactly what I must have been doing, zoning out, because as I'm, you know, pretty pretty far along, uh, I realized that they were kind of closing off the street. There were people lining the, the sidewalks. There was some kind of organized event. Realized that I couldn't go back the same way that I came up. So had to run up the, the, the beach. And it was one of those things where we, we've all been there, right? The idea was great. Uh, our body didn't necessarily like it. Um, it. It just was one of those days. It did, did not feel good. And I was really you know, trudging my way forward. And I noticed that every time I thought about the distance I needed to travel, I felt worse. You know that feeling when you're uncomfortable? It's the thought of having to endure that for a long period of time that's most taxing. Sure, right now is uncomfortable, but you know what creates the anxiety is that it goes on for a long period of time. We don't see an end to the immediate. We can't stop thinking about the space between where we are and where we have to be. 
right? So I'm continuing along and, you know, my mind sort of makes its way back to my freshman year in college. And this is an important part in my life specifically because it's when I really learned what it meant to work hard. I had no idea. You know, and I speak about this often because I, I went through high school, I had good grades, I was a decent athlete, but I didn't understand what it meant to truly work. You know, my first month in college as part of the, the rowing team there was where I learned that just because you're suffering, just because you're hurting, doesn't mean you're entitled to anything. Someone else out there is suffering just as much. The difference is they might be getting more out of it. They're not feeling sorry for themselves. And that mentality was eye-opening for me. It's not, look at me, I'm a hero for putting myself through this. It's, yeah, it's uncomfortable. She's also uncomfortable. Which one of you guys is going to turn that into results? That's what defines winners. And I remember, you know, the first workouts uh, I did. I remember doing jump squats and wall sits with my teammates and, and emphasizing ways to break down the exercise into simple pieces. Mentally, right? Little pieces that the mind was okay with, that weren't so scary. A two-minute wall sit is pretty intimidating. A 20-second wall sit, that's not so bad. So do six of those. Say something funny between each set. Find a way to tear down, uh, you, you know, the mental obstacles because the body can take so much if the mind lowers its defenses and simply allows it. So anyway, I'm making my, my way forward uh, up the coast and I stopped thinking about how far I had to go. I just stopped. I did not let it enter my brain. My focus went very specifically to every two steps, counting one, two, one, two, one, two, because anyone can do anything for two steps. It's not hard. Again, it just so happens that they stack up and create miles, but miles is not my concern. Right? I'm not physically able to leap a mile. No one can do that. What I'm capable of doing is taking steps. That's all I can do. And it's manageable, and I can say without a doubt that that changed my experience. It took the pressure off. Right? If you don't feel like you're in control, you will have a very tough time generating results. Because again, no one can leap a mile. And so a big part of success is rearranging the deck so that you have that control. You're behind the wheel. Sometimes it's just reminding yourself that the little things create the big things. The pieces stack up and every single thing in life can be broken down into those little pieces. And guess what? They're not scary. When you take the cover off, they're not overwhelming. Most importantly, they're completely within your control. Right. On a similar note, a friend of mine recently asked the other day about YouTube. He's got a, a follower a base of entrepreneurs. Right? A lot of them are looking to take their business onto the platform. Uh, was asking me some questions. And he asked, you know, what was the moment that sparked your channel's growth? And it's a funny question because the, the 100,000 subscriber mark was something that, you know, right from the get-go, the onset that I, I was looking forward to, I was aiming for. But there was never that mile leap, right? There was no single video that changed the trajectory of my viewership or channel or business. That's not how it happens. It's a step-by-step -step process. You can't jump to 100,000 or 500,000 or a million subscribers. And starting out, all I would think about is how far I had to go. I'd get all worked up and stressed out and, you know, disappointed but you learn lessons as you go through things. And I realized that you don't get X many subscribers in a day. And if that's your focus, of course you'll be overwhelmed because you can't control that. But what you can control is every thought, every video, every interaction with someone who cares about your message. And if you stay true to that, your consistency manifests itself in the form of a growing subscriber base. You know, and the point is, it doesn't matter what you're doing, right? Talk about running, talk about YouTube, it could be sports, it could be relationships, it could be anything. 
Yes, you want to understand where you're going. You want to know your target. You want to lock in a direction. Then let go. Goals derail us because we forget what they're made of. They're made of little vulnerable pieces. To get to the top of a mountain, you have to climb it rock by rock. And when you're looking up from the base, yes, it's demoralizing. It might even seem impossible. But no one can cover that distance. It's about the steps to the top. And then at some point, so long as you decide not to turn around, so long as you remain committed to overcoming each tiny obstacle, each barrier, you'll be at the top looking down at everything else, everything below you. Why? Because you didn't see the stack. You saw the pieces that were laid on top of each other, one by one. And that makes all the difference. Success is seeing what's beyond the surface, what's past the things staring you in the face. And if you can manage to do that, you'll see that nothing in life, nothing is too big or too tough for you. There's a saying that just because you've spent a long time making a mistake doesn't mean you need to continue making it. There's an incredible advantage in life for those who can separate past and future, who can recognize sunk costs and walk away, walk away from the past, move on to new things. But here's the challenge, right? Like so many things, our instinct is to preserve. It's, yeah, but I've invested so many years. I've spent X amount of dollars and maybe I don't like where I'm at, but look how long it's taken me to get here. Well, here's the reality. That time is gone. That money is not coming back no matter what you do or what direction you take from here on out. There's no reason to think you have to maintain the same trajectory or hold on to a specific identity or pattern of behavior. Yesterday isn't the focal point here. The goal is simpler. What matters now and how will you get there now? You've grown, you've evolved, you've changed and your targets have shifted. So why shouldn't you? The idea of sunk costs is so important because it's essentially realizing that you're not indebted to the resources you've spent or exhausted. There's no need to be a slave to previous decisions that you've made. No, just chalk it up as an integral step in your learning process, an aspect of growth, and move forward to what matters, to what you care about. Now, if that seems obvious, I challenge you to think about the decisions you've made over the last year, and I guarantee you, you've let factors affect your decision-making that are irrelevant to your goals. Because we feel this camaraderie with yesterday, like there's a debt to be paid, but man, life is too short to run in place. If it's not pushing you forward, drop it. If it's not what you need, forget it. In other words, don't be one of those people that wakes up and makes the same mistake every single day because you've spent a long time making it. See, reality only exists in your head, and that's why it's beautiful. You can unlock the cell door and walk out. Don't lose sight of the greatest gift you have, the new beginning that lives in every second where you can take a turn you've never taken before, remove the mask and play a role you've never played. Let that sense of excitement pull you to new things. Let go of what you can't change. 
and pursue what you can. Forget the time spent. Think of now. Where can you invest now? Your surroundings didn't magically arrive. You chose them. And you can just as easily take that wheel and leave. Simple formula. What is best for you and how do you get there? Not where you feel obligated to be or expected to be or pressured to be. Where do you need to be? Everything else is noise. Everything else is a rope keeping your ship on shore and you are not confined to that harbor or yesterday's destination. You're built to chase the horizon, follow your curiosity into the sunset. You don't make decisions based on yesterday's story. You sculpt it with tomorrow's possibility. At night, the sky becomes visible. The darkness, the muting out of everything else allows the stars to finally shine through, to make their presence known. And during the day, conversely, one cannot see those stars, but the world around him on the ground becomes illuminated. It's a push and pull that seems to work perfectly. And I think there's something poetic about the partnership existing between the big picture goal and the small steps required to bring it to life. As one of my favorite sayings goes, keeping your head in the clouds and your feet on the ground. Because here's what's interesting. If one were to only look up at the goal, she'd be consistently reminding herself of the ideal without taking the necessary steps to get there. And if one were to only look down at her feet, well, her steps would eventually become aimless. And it's that duality, right? The need to uh, both reassure yourself you can see the stars, as well as use the world around you to pull yourself closer to them that changes things. It's that beautiful dance that has to be maintained. And this is a balancing act that uh, has certainly been challenging. Sometimes the pendulum swings way too far one way, sometimes way too far the other. But in a perfect world, you know, you want it gravitating towards the center. I remember just starting the YouTube channel almost a decade ago having, you know, big multi-million subscriber goals, but completely lacking the systems and everyday practices in place that would walk me towards that finish line, right? I mean, sure, something's better than nothing. I was working and learning, but the actions simply didn't align with the objective. I had to correct them. And then I've been on the other end as well, right? I'd be doing things every day without knowing why. All steps, no goal. That sort of thing um, occurs when routine takes on a life of its own. You start doing things because, well, it's what I do. It's what I've always done. And, uh, you know, this is when one has to look in the mirror and ask the difficult questions. And look, anytime I can squeeze the complexities down into the simple, I try and do that. So with that in mind, my questioning goes like this. What do you want? Know the answer? Okay, good. Next question. Is what you're doing taking you closer every day to what you want? Asking that question in a serious way takes a spotlight to one's world. Using my previous metaphor, it shuts the lights off so the North Star becomes visible. And then, right, turns them back on to ask yourself uh, if you're using your resources to move there. And I've become pretty good at asking myself this question consistently, and still I find things that don't belong. That sort of, you know, they hide in plain view. 
I have faith that I'll end up exactly where I need to be. But that faith is rooted in my commitment to continually assess, to scrutinize and adjust. There's very little hope and a substantial amount of trust in my ability to continue forward. There's an idea referred to as the Stockdale Paradox, which states, and this is the the first definition I grabbed from Google here, you must never confuse faith that you'll prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. That's where the tough love thing comes in. Be your biggest fan because no one will believe in you unless you do. It all starts with your trust in yourself to navigate the process and arrive where you must arrive. But it also requires you are your biggest critic. It means the reason you trust yourself to get there is because you know you won't just sit back and say, eh, I'll win because I believe I'll win. No, you'll win because you will while having your head in the clouds be brutally pragmatic with the steps you're taking on the ground. You'll win because you're committed to learning and adjusting. One of my favorite Uh, epiphanies when I started doing this full time was the realization at a very small scale at first that, whoa, someone can't fail unless they quit. You can't lose unless you stop. Impossible, someone might think, right? Well, no, because when you miss the mark or you fall short, You take a second to understand why, and then you come back to the problem or challenge again, right? This means life is a game of tenacity, of persistence, of commitment. The one who keeps adjusting and coming back is bound to connect the dots eventually, which makes failure the simple decision that, eh, this isn't worth it for me. I don't want to continue adjusting and re-engaging with this. And look, hey, depending on the situation, that may be the move, right? There have been things in my life where after sufficient trial and error, sufficient data, I've said, this doesn't align with who I am or what I want. I'm going to walk away and pivot to something that does, right? But the key is knowing that it is a decision. To not reach a particular goal is a choice to no longer attack it relentlessly. And so when you feel lost or defeated or even frustrated with the process, try that line of questioning. What do I want? And is what I'm doing today bringing me there? This allows you to start taking a sledgehammer uh, to the things that don't belong, refining the process. And yeah, sometimes walking away from the things that are no longer in the scope of who you want to be and where you're going. But the power is in knowing, it's in understanding that your footsteps, the little actions of your, you know, your day to day, they are incredibly powerful. But most of all, when you are methodical with them, when they're pointed in the right direction. So pick your stars carefully and own those steps that take you towards them. Failure is not a a sickness you catch. It doesn't fall on your head like a piano in those old cartoons. It's a choice. Meaning, in positive terms, as long as you are committed to learn, reapproach, and repeat, you will find yourself atop the mountain. As long as you're willing to evolve, you will ultimately arrive.
So you've made a decision. Congrats, you're 3% done. Now I'm paraphrasing, but that's an idea from author and entrepreneur Lee Benson. Belief and execution, the duo that will change your life. First, believe. Why? Because nothing happens without belief. Nothing begins without an understanding and a trust that the future contains something of value. That the seeds of discomfort being planted will bear fruit. We simply don't walk through doors if we don't believe something of value exists on the other side. And then there's execution, the doing. Congrats, you gave yourself permission to begin. That was a big step, right? But now you have to deal with life, and life, my friends, is no picnic. It's in the doing that success is either obtained or not, that a new reality is birthed or not. In the book, Your Most Important Number, Lee Benson has said, so you've made a decision, congrats, you're 3% done. Why? Because well, now comes the implementation, the execution. Now the feet are on the ground and the wheels, the road. And we must transform the thoughts into things. Thinking can be so much more convenient than doing. Execution is trying things. It's recognizing the attempts that didn't work. It's moving forward only to realize wrong path or wrong approach. Or maybe what's required of you is not yet something you're capable of producing and so you must evolve. It's seeing setbacks as data points. It's understanding that to not know is okay because we collect our answers as we go. And seeing the journey is an experiment, one in which we seek to understand ourselves and the world, there is so much contained in that 97%. To write your own ending storybook, an infinite number of paths and outcomes, but ultimately only discoverable by you. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about life. And once you give yourself permission to walk a certain path, once you believe in something greater than the world as it currently exists, you become an artist, painting something that was not there before, using the highs as little benchmarks to remind you why you started to begin with when your landscape becomes gray. It's using the lows as fuel that turns the ordinary into extraordinary, that slingshots the old you to the new you, adding brightness and vibrance to the overall scene. You're encapsulating all of it as you move through that great unknown, as you push further and further into the abyss. You're playing the role of maker, not because you knew how it would all turn out, but because you didn't, and still, you executed. Recently in an interview, I heard Alex Hermosi, a now accomplished entrepreneur in his own right, talking about some of his failings, consulting gyms in the fitness industry, the moment when things went south, and he lost it all. Now for a moment, he thought he had money, assets, and perhaps even the pride, gone. But came to learn that money and those assets, they are lagging indicators. They aren't the value that's obtained. The value is who you become. The value is learning how to be someone who can obtain those things in the first place. It's emerging from the old restriction and limitation, the old narratives because that cannot be taken away. When we execute, we're making ourselves something we otherwise could never have become. 
And so Alex learned that what he lost was insignificant compared to what he gained. And why is this such a common theme? With industry leaders, folks speaking on their accomplishments, I think the answer is simple because you don't get there without the doing and the execution. And if to execute means to step forward without having all the answers, after all, we are only human, life will humble us. Excellence must be a game of trial and error. We can't escape those lost everything stories because choosing the right path every time well, that only happens when you choose no path at all. We have to act and be okay understanding that action brings with it mistakes and lessons and setbacks. You know, all those little annoying things that become greatness. 97% is left because the path before you is unwalked. But know that it contains everything everything you need. So believe it. Decide. Because nothing starts without that initial 3%. But nothing changes without the subsequent 97. That's where we are shaped. And when you come face to face with the inevitable adversity, know that life might take the material gains. It might demand a price you deem to be steep. It might collect as a toll assets you've been accumulating along the way. But it can't take what you know or who you've become. And that is why you execute. To build the world around you, yes, but most importantly, to build yourself into someone who can thrive in such an environment. It's in doing that the man is built. And as was said in Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, build the man and the world falls into place. There's often a vast distinction between what we think is holding us back and what is actually holding us back. And that may even be putting it lightly. Most of the time we're just plain misinformed. Most of the time we're looking externally at irrelevant discrepancies between ourselves and someone else. We're looking at things that happened yesterday, possible outcomes that may happen tomorrow. We're creating entire stories, crafting narratives, building hostile worlds that simply don't exist. When what we need is simple, to give ourselves permission to let ourselves walk out that front door and towards what we long for. And this came to light recently. I, I shared a, a simple 20 second message on TikTok where uh, basically I highlighted John Green's quote about the best things in life occurring after we find the courage to depart or leave where we are, right? To build again. And as I was looking at the response, it was both beautiful and eye-opening. Hundreds and hundreds of comments from people saying that the message helped them feel empowered to do what they've been putting off. And some called it fate. Some called it what they needed to hear at the exact moment they needed to hear it. And as I'm going through, I, I, I keep thinking the same thing over and over and over. Every single one of these people 
they already knew in their hearts what needed to come next. They knew what would make them feel alive. They knew where the compass was pointing. Yet their default led them to the same place we've all been, waiting for external permission, waiting for life to give us a reason to say, okay, the light is now green. You can go. The time is right. Now, don't get me wrong. It means the world that a simple message can shift one's perspective that way. I've been on the receiving end. Stuck looking for some type of guidance we all have, but I think we'd all agree that if that guidance helps us get back on track, then the real question should be, how do we live so that we can stay to the best of our ability on track? Find ourselves less prone to those occurrences, more confident in ourselves, in our dreams, in where we're going. And for me, it's been understanding that in my life, I am the one that creates, signs, and sends the permission slips. I say go. And when I remember that, I'm free to do what's best for me. I'm simultaneously the architect and the pieces, the wind and the sail. See, you don't need a reason to walk out of a relationship you're not happy in. You don't need a reason to leave a job that's not pushing you to be who you most want to become. You don't need a reason to change a habit or reinvent yourself or begin again. No, all you need is the courage to green light what your heart already knows it wants. We think that the external world has the answers for us. When in reality, we've had them the whole time. We just want something to point to, to say, see, I was right. But we don't need to be reactive. We can be proactive. You can be the one that lights the fire. When you follow your intuition, your heart, your sense of purpose, life conforms because it has to conform. When you become an immovable object, life around you moves. It makes way. And if it doesn't, then you go back to the drawing board, you adapt and adjust. And that's the beauty of life. That's how we build meaning, trusting ourselves to walk into that resistance. Because the friction and that headwind is never what's holding us back. Are they uncomfortable? Yeah. At times, does it scare us? Sure. It's supposed to. But it's not what holds you back. Waiting for someone or something to come along and green light your journey through life is what holds you back. And it's funny, I think we again and again overlook the simplest of truths. The hardest part is starting. It's convincing yourself that one, it's possible, and two, you're worth it. Everything else you face from the second you walk out that front door can be conquered. In fact, we ourselves grow along the way so that we can rise up and meet the demands of life, but it's unquestionably doable. That thought as you look out the window, right? What if the worst case scenario happens? It can't because the worst case scenario is sitting in that seat your whole life, looking out the window and imagining a world where you found the courage to be more, to explore, to live life as it was meant to be lived. But let's say, let's say that what we fear does come to fruition. Then I ask, what are the odds it's reversible? Probably high. 
Let's say I want to start a podcast and I finally work up the courage and I get my mic and I start my show and no one listens. But I keep going and I keep going and nothing sticks. And most importantly, I learned, look, I'm really not crazy about this idea. It wasn't what I thought it was. It's not me. Okay, perfect. Now you know. And sure, it took time to learn that lesson. But you have the rest of your life to continue the beautiful experiment to search for what lights you up. But you found the courage to explore, to try, to begin, and you are now better because of it. That's your worst case scenario? Sounds a lot less scary to me than a life lived sitting there looking out the window. See, we can't let the fear of an unlikely worst case stop the possibility of that oh so coveted best case. Don't let the virtually 0% probability of losing everything overshadow the opportunity to gain everything. Let's never allow ourselves to get caught standing still waiting for the universe to give us the answer as though we're waiting for a letter in the mail. No, give yourself permission to see the upside, to make your own decisions, and most importantly, to live your life. When the run got difficult, I would often count street lights. Why? Because at some point, I realized that it wasn't so much the immediate moment that was painful, as it was the idea that I had to continue on, a fear of the unknown. Our minds are brilliant because they have the power to gaze into the future, to anticipate, to predict. And sometimes that prediction materializes in the form of stress and pain in the present. A pain that, let's face it, is manufactured. See, the present moment may be uncomfortable, but it's manageable. It's always something we can harness and adapt ourselves to. But make-believe scenarios, the imaginary monsters we let in, well, I don't know how well-equipped we are to handle those, so I've found solace in simply keeping them out. See, counting streetlights, it brings me to the now. I can always get to the next streetlight. In fact, it's always visibly in front of me. It's tangible. It's real. There is no space for tricks or scary stories. When I count streetlights, my mind's job is to focus on those tall metal fixtures. And the body's job is to listen and move accordingly. And while sure there is pain, it is manageable. When you look it directly in the eyes, Not with regard to what it can be, but as it exists now in this moment. We can always rise to be more than we once thought possible. These streetlights simply remind us of that fact. And so beyond this moment, when the running shoes are off, long after the finish line cross, It's imperative that the idea remains that yes, life will be painful and life can hurt, but it never gives you in one instant more than you can handle. And sometimes it might seem so. Sometimes it might appear overwhelming, but when we remind ourselves that we're simply borrowing pain from a future that has not yet arrived, When we refocus on what is within our control, we empower ourselves. 
our greatness expands and our strength intensifies. Because look, there's a time and a place for everything. And in our moments of duress, when the world is weighing down on us, I've found the answer to be thinking less and trusting more. And the next footstep transforms into not the detail, but the story in its entirety. Sure, sometimes life is about planning and calculating and strategizing, but sometimes life also calls us to put our heads down, shut our minds off, and find a way to move towards something greater. It's step, step, light post, step, step, light post, demoting the discomfort from the star of the movie or the main character to a subtle observer. Sitting quietly in the background as you do what you were going to do anyway, with or without it. Never forget how much control you have over the current moment. And that our greatest pain is often masked in a fiction, a delusion. When we find ourselves stuck, it's because of a future that has one, not arrived and two is outside the scope of the task at hand. It's not because of what's around the corner that we survive life's trying times. It's because we dig deep enough to get to that next light post, that next day, that next stop, that next chapter. Look, you will emerge victorious not because of the future, but the now, because you realize your strength, shut off the world, and conquered your next step. When our backs are against the wall, we're forced to become more. When the clock is ticking, we are tasked with finding answers that hide among us. It's in the darkness we find light, and while lost, we find ourselves. The paradox of life is that from our pain comes our purpose, our evolution, and our greatness. I love thinking back to about 2014, making my way around Boston, having just quit my job, essentially purposeless, clinging to a YouTube channel and a podcast idea that I would name Your World Within. And why, why do I think back? Why does this mean everything to me? Well, because at the time I knew nothing. I understood nothing, nothing about speaking or media, audio, video, nothing about running a business. But more importantly, I knew very little about life and what's truly required to progress in a world with infinite moving parts. I didn't know that my lack of understanding is what made everything feel overwhelming and complex, and that it was up to me to simplify. I didn't know the extent to which I'd have to befriend failure. And that was the most eye-opening realization. Because when you gravitate towards a risk-free existence and you box yourself in as I had for so long, um, of course, you don't get the upside, but you also don't fail as dramatically either. You know, life was a simple game of cause and effect. Do work, get result, not much room for more than that. And so stepping outside that box in the way that I did uh, changed some rules. I learned some things. 
First, you can spend time on something. You can exhaust energy on something and get nothing in the short term for your effort. And I mean nothing. Unless you count getting your pride stomped on. Unless you count your friends uh, disappearing when you need them most. Unless you count self-doubt and a constant uh, worry about not amounting to anything. I mean, these are very raw, very real human emotions. They tend to arise when we start something new, but in them is also the power. This is where the light bulb turns on and the path emerges. It's where I learned that we only get what we want when we endure or what we don't. And what a foreign concept when you think about it, right? It's like, Eddie, take this mic. Go stand in front of this audience and pour your heart out. Your knees are shaking, chest is pounding, but dude, trust me, it'll be good for you. And funny enough, it was. It was because the fear in my stomach became the indicator that something new, something exciting, something more was around the corner. Like Pavlov's dog hearing that bell. Anytime the fear kicked in, I could feel myself getting closer to something meaningful, to a higher version of myself. The pain is an invite. The sheer terror and let's face it, that's what it feels like sometimes. It's an upgrade. Disguised as the monster that you think you should be running from. When it is, as I recently mentioned, the adversary you should befriend. We have to change our relationship with discomfort because our initial understanding, the one that comes stock in our minds, is never sufficient to build anything of significance. Its default setting is to preserve the now, not expand it. And so just like those stock speakers that came in my 1999 Ford F-150 when I was in my early 20s, let's rip it out. Let's customize. Let's upgrade the quality of the sound we hear and the things we say to ourselves. What an advantage it is to know that the hard things are what make us level up. To find that awareness. What a blessing that when life's difficulty startles and scatters the masses, you could be the one that remains standing tall, seeking out the advantage amidst the commotion. Every little act of courage becomes more and more meaningful, powerful. But we must lose ourselves to find ourselves. We must embrace our fears if we are to become courageous. We must fail in order to succeed. And sure, sometimes the price seems steep. But I promise, not going costs more. Wishing costs more. If only's cost more. So maybe for you, it isn't a YouTube channel or a speaking career. Maybe it's something totally different. But it is something. And should you bring yourself to pursue that which your heart pulls you to pursue, you'll have those moments of defeat where you're mad at yourself for leaving the comfort and safety of your previous world. You'll have times where you have no idea what to do, where you feel alone or stuck or unsure. The difference will be whether you see this as the invite you've been waiting for or the reason to turn around and settle for less. That's the question. How do you internalize all that emotion that will feel like it is consuming you? I couldn't believe how strong that temptation was to go back, nagging at me every day. Just come off the edge. Just be comfortable again. But as my old coach would say in college, when we're doing wall sits or something physically taxing, 15 seconds. You can do anything for 15 seconds. 
And isn't life just a culmination of 15 second windows? It's compartmentalizing the process. It's turning the difficult into the advantageous. You have the ability to not think like everyone else. You have it within you to rewire your previous conceptions of the world, to see darkness not as your reason to hide from conjured up monsters, but as your invitation to become the light. Remember that the best way to be more is to have the courage to put your back against the wall. And you won't want to in the moment. There will never be a perfect time but committing to that vulnerability will release from within you the power, the strength, the greatness that has been for so long tucked away. By moving into the chaos, you are simultaneously creating the calm you always dreamed of. You're realizing the possibility that just needed the door left ajar to make its way into your world. She had a picture framed on the table that said, make today amazing. Placed there to remind her just how much of life is a choice. How much we get to decide. It symbolizes that on our worst days, life hands us lessons. And on our best days, the highs of existence. During our low points, currency. And during our high points, the chance to cash it all in. Yeah, make today amazing. Because today's are few and far between. Today's are not an inconvenience, nor an obligation. Today's are what it's all about. Today is the big show. The answers we look for. The destinations we long for. Today is a place of dreams. That is, if you choose to leave room in your world for dreaming. Today is the beginning of wherever next is for you. A chance to see the new and normalize it, to stretch, to reach further out and pull impossible a little closer into your orbit. You can do that. And while one often can't control what they are given, they can control what becomes of what they are given. Like architects, and designers engineering what will be and what the malleable world around them will become. When one raises their standards, life seems to accommodate. Because believing it means acting the part, means making the changes, means the external world makes room, means your identity is reinforced and so the cycle goes. By making today amazing, you are making yourself more. Decisions are the beginning of all things. See, very rarely is the tool in and of itself the differentiator. It's the vision that pulls us through. And if you take something arbitrary, say a hammer, there's no way to, based upon its existence, determine what it will mean or what will become of it. A hammer can be an agent of chaos. It can smash and shatter and destroy. It can be the thing used to tear down. Or 
it can be what built. It can connect. It can alter and redefine so that something, when all is said and done, is brought into an existence that never was. It was never the tool. It was how the eyes viewed the tool. It was the vision that designated the roles that made today amazing. And the reason we all need this reminder, as far as I can tell, is because the difficult things just so happen to be the meaningful things. Because we are fighting not against some little rule or idea we picked up along the way. We are fighting against our DNA, against thousands and thousands of years of evolution. Because the fear that kept our ancestors alert and alive now in a totally new world keeps us contained and our talents minimized. The approval of others that kept us safe and secure as we once traveled the landscape in small groups, hunting and gathering, well, now it keeps us needlessly looking over our shoulders and craving acceptance. The unknowns that kept us out of the dark cave with the predator living in its shadows now keeps us confined, looking out at life's potential through self-made windows. We need to be reminded to make today amazing because those things are quite the adversaries. Because our default is to just let the ship sail. Our default is to simply survive. After all, that is the standard and the rule by which living things abide. Make it another day. But I believe you are more than a living thing. The godlike ability to not just exist in a world, but create new ones is a miracle, both a blessing and a responsibility to drive towards a more fulfilled you, a happier you, a healthier you, a more complete you. But one must first become aware that around them exist the pieces required to build something never before seen. The vehicle to those far off places that were once only dreams, thoughts, illusions. I've always believed that if it means something to you, it's not stupid, it warrants exploration. For even if the thought doesn't end up being all it was cracked up to be, even if it's not the destination, but only a stop along the way, it still pushes you to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. It still moves you forward in this beautiful game of life. So decide. Decide to make today amazing. Choose to make it better. Let the obstacles lift you up and the momentum carry you towards something meaningful. When others stop and find reasons to doubt themselves. How about you find this small wind buried, tucked away underneath it all? The little key that may do nothing more than get you through that next door. After all, sometimes that's what life's about. Picking up your head when it's most difficult and finding the next door to walk through. And the magic is knowing you can always do that. Because there always exists both the doorway and the key, but we must be willing to find it. That's the obvious thing about those doors. The right ones will open, but they require we find the strength to approach them. They require that we seek out amazing. And so with this in mind, what is the next chapter like for you? Are you currently enduring one of life's winters are you navigating those inevitable valleys of despair in which the value is in finding that single ray of light amidst the storm? Looking within yourself for the courage to take one more step forward 
and another and another? Are you seeking out that spark that will reignite the fire in you? Because it's there. So long as you choose to make today amazing. Maybe you've climbed yourself out. Maybe you're looking for whatever's next, the new evolution. Seeking to follow your heart and continue the beautiful progression that is life. Let the external world support that vision. Choose to see the detail not as trivial, but as the answers. The tools that will lift you up and support what you are building, it's there. She had a picture framed on the table that said, make today amazing. Placed there to remind her how much of life is a choice. Because in a world of option, what a gift to choose the journey of a lifetime. What a ride that awaits so long as you decide to step in. What exactly are you afraid of? What's holding you back? As the giant rock you inhabit spins through the universe, a speck in a galaxy of stars, it's easy to look out and see the vastness of the world around you and forget entirely about the strength that you possess. Forget entirely that the mind's capacity is as infinite as those same stars that surround you. I don't think it's that we definitively choose to sell ourselves short. I think we simply lose sight of the fact that we have a say in the matter to begin with. Our fears keep us wishing our insecurities keep us hoping we stay standing still when we should be moving forward. But truth be told, our pain comes from not doing, but wishing that we did. It's no coincidence that the more we fail, the more we realize life is a game that expands as we push. The power of making mistakes isn't the mistake itself, it's that when we get back up and brush ourselves off, our cognitive mapping of the world changes. We see that we can step out a little further. Our very definition of what's possible expands, and I believe that's what courage is. The willingness to step into that chaos of life, knowing that each time you find the strength to push forward, you are restructuring your reality. The resources are there, the tools are there, the opportunity is there. How crazy is the fact that we just need to convince ourselves that more is worth it? That the difficulty of short-term vulnerability isn't an enemy. It's the very ticket required for admission to the show. And so I ask again, what are you afraid of? Falling? Because you will rise, and you will rise stronger than you ever were. Is it criticism? Because one, people are so focused on their own endeavors that they look up way less than we think they do. And two, other than the small group you surround yourself with, why would you care? Is it pride? Because building things of significance requires starting on the ground floor, and there's no shame but honor in breaking down to build up. And when I look at my life in terms of chapters, right? Childhood, high school, college, 20s, 30s, the things that were my biggest concerns during each chapter are now laughable. And maybe, just maybe, if I saw that, I could have lived a little freer, been a little bolder. What if we were to get ahead of that learning curve? What if we understood that life is beautiful and flexible and exciting? And what if we understood that now? Instead of looking at this chapter 15 years down the road and chuckling to ourselves for not having the courage to have made the leap, taken the chance 
to have moved out into an unknown. We cannot physically see that which doesn't exist, which is why it's so important that we know we are the architects, that the fear pulsing through our veins is indicating that we are building, that we are choosing to step into a world that will give more if we find the courage to ask. So as this giant rock you inhabit spins through the universe, a speck in a galaxy of stars, Perhaps each little light up there exists not to remind you how small you are, but to remind you that those same elements exist within you. To show you that the fire of a million suns sits in your soul, beats in your chest, waits for your signal now. So what are you afraid of? Sometimes what we need most is not what we think we need most. It's not that break we've been waiting for the universe to provide or the answer we've been desperately seeking. No, sometimes we need only three words. Don't give up. Don't turn back now. And see, I know you want to. And that the meaningful thing, the right thing, requires we give all of ourselves. It, metaphorically speaking, is the most expensive, exhausting, sometimes disheartening. But this is your reminder that there will come a point when you look back on this moment and the best thing you'll have ever done will have been continuing to put one foot in front of the other, continuing forward despite the circumstances, towards that which means something to you. I remember in South Florida, a handful of years ago, I'd just moved down here and I uh, was exploring the area a little bit, looking for a place to live, and I found this kind of odd little park in between a parking lot and the beach. And I pulled over, just started walking around, and ended up sitting down on this bench that faced the ocean, and just looked out for a while. I remember looking at the people who all seemed so happy. They all seemed fulfilled, looked like they had it all together. I looked at the ocean that was so much bigger than me, so vast, so powerful. At the non-stop stream of planes flying overhead that all seemed to have a direction, a purpose. They had their courses mapped. And I think I remember it so vividly because I'd never felt more alone than at that moment. Like deeply, painfully alone. And it's not that I enjoy bringing up these types of experiences. I bring them up because time has revealed repeatedly that from these moments of doubt and sometimes even despair come what we need most. So long as we don't run from what the world is trying to provide us. It's as though we must experience emptiness before we can become fulfilled. We need to be overcome with this sensation that there's no way out before realizing that there is always a way so long as we're willing to find it. And the pain associated with that willingness, well, it far outweighs the alternative. I often break things down into this dichotomy of 
the easy, meaningless way versus the hard, meaningful way. But that may be oversimplified, right? Easy compared to what? Hard compared to what? It's easy to shut down when we're at our lowest. It's easy to stop when it hurts. But easy now evolves into what's actually incredibly difficult tomorrow. A difficult, heart-wrenching, regretful forever. Admittedly, a controversial figure, but regardless, one of the most important quotes I've ever read was by Lance Armstrong in his book, It's Not About the Bike. He says, pain is temporary. It may last a minute or an hour or a day or a year, but eventually it will subside and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it lasts forever. See, the easy thing versus the hard thing is too simplified, void of imperative context. The question is, in our darkest moments, will we stand up when it hurts so that we can walk, run, and ultimately sprint towards what matters. There's a realization that helped me because when we're in these situations, the thought goes like this. Things are wrong, things are broken. My life isn't what it should be. I need to fix this and make it whole, make it right, so I can live a good life like everyone else. Like, there's a deep loneliness associated with that misconception as though the world is put together, but I, I am not. Well, let me dispel that notion and end that narrative. The world is a series of objects that mean nothing other than the value we place upon them. Seven billion people, all fighting their own battles, all trying to make sense of things all pretending like the little fairy tale they've manufactured in their heads is the real thing or the right thing. When in actuality, we are all just passengers along on a ride we do not understand. Fighting battles that we don't often comprehend and cannot grasp. But you are not broken. You are human perfectly imperfect, equipped with the tools to take another step forward despite the chaos and the uncertainty. Steps that become, in the end, everything. I remember reading about Jefferson, how he had migraines so severe while president that he would do most of his important work in the morning because of the high probability he could literally be incapacitated from noon on. And I just thought, man, we are all fighting battles. We're all doing what we can to make the most of our circumstance, to redirect discomfort into opportunity and pain into progress. And what's most incredible is that we can. There's a saying that it's not supposed to be easy. That getting where you need to go requires the treacherous path associated with a hero's journey, the vast unknowns, the questions that remain unanswered for extended periods of time, the villains that seemingly inject themselves into our lives. Please understand that this is not a reflection of you, who you are and your capabilities. This is the game of life. This is today's difficulty in exchange for tomorrow's meaning. The pressure that creates the diamonds and you don't have to be sure of anything. Other than that you know you will continue stepping forward. Because you can. Things won't always go right. But in the failures are the new tools to grow and redirect. You won't always feel on top of the world, but it's in the valleys of despair that we're forced to truly analyze, to think deeply, reapproach. And perhaps most importantly, you may have days where you let yourself down, fall short, perhaps lose sight of the courage to which you have attached your dreams, but that's okay. You are defined not by your mistakes, but by the present moment. 
not some impossible expectation of perfection, but by your ability to rise and rise again when it requires all of you to lift your head up and carry on. So go into that unknown where fear is transformed into courage and doubt to strength. Go. Because if not here, where? And if not now, when? Go. All you need, you have. And when life finds you sitting down on a park bench, staring out at a world that feels too big and too complex, that seems impossible to navigate, find it within yourself to smile. Smile because of what you've already overcome, what you've been through, who you are. Remember that you are exactly where you need to be, staring up at the meaning in life as opposed to down at your feet. Now go. No miracles here. No mountains need be jumped or oceans crossed. But if you, one, step forward, and two, believe in yourself to put the pieces together as they arrive, there is nothing you can't do or be. There is no obstacle before you that is insurmountable. Just keep going. And sure, sometimes that's all we can do. But it also happens to be true that it is your greatest superpower to simply find a way to run if you can, crawl if you must, but find a way. Because deep down in your soul, the pieces are there. And it will be, at some point, as you look back, the greatest decision you've ever made.